Part 1, Chapter 9. Once he was gone, my mom went downstairs, and I returned to my room. I picked up my Game Boy, but there was no way I could play anything. Around noon, my mom called me down to lunch. Everything looked the way it always did. The cut flowers were in the vase in the center of the cream-colored table in the kitchen. My sandwich, a sliced apple, and a chocolate chip cookie sat perfectly arranged on a rose-patterned plate. A glass of milk was just to the right. Across from my food were my mom's bowl of plain yogurt with blueberries and her cup of tea. Everything neat and tidy, the way she liked it. I managed to eat half of the sandwich and most of the apple. She finished about the same amount of her lunch. When I was done, I scraped my plate clean and put it in the sink. I turned to go back upstairs, but my mom stopped me. Sit down a minute, Mick. There's something you need to hear. I sat. For a moment, she looked out the window at our rose bush. Then she turned back to me. All those things you found out on the internet. I know they hurt you, but your dad didn't kill anybody. He didn't rob a bank or burn a building. I want you to remember that it's just football, okay? Just a game. I started to answer, then stopped. What? She said. I shook my head. Nothing. Tell me. It's more than a game to him, Mom, I said, and it's more than a game to me, too. She frowned. Only if you let it be, Mick. My dad didn't come home for dinner that night, but my mom told me not to worry. He called. He drove up into the mountains to Roslyn. I told him to rent a cabin and stay the night. He'll be back tomorrow. I ate half a hamburger for dinner. Afterward, I kept going through what I was going to say to him when he came back. I'd try not to be mad at him, and for a while I'd convince myself that my mom was right, but then I'd get mad at him all over again. All that stuff about his ankle sprain. He should have told me the truth. He returned Sunday afternoon. We ate lunch together, a fresh bunch of flowers in the center of the table. My mom acted as if everything were normal, but he was stiff, like a stranger. My stomach was in knots. I was afraid I'd throw up if I ate, but I was afraid if I didn't eat, he'd ask me what was wrong. I picked up the cheese sandwich, ate most of a banana, and drank half my milk. After lunch, I started back up the stairs to my room, but his voice stopped me. Let's go for a drive, Mick, he said. His Wrangler was a hardtop but with the windows down, plenty of fresh air blows through. He drove out across the Aurora Bridge to West Seattle and down the Alki Beach. On the way, we talked about nothing. The sunshine, the Seahawks, the Mariners. He parked along the water of Alki. We walked on the pathway above the beach for a half mile or so. Then he spotted a picnic bench. Let's sit down, he said. Fujin Sound was a glittering dark blue, its islands a dark green, the sky dotted with puffy white clouds. It was an incredible day, and I couldn't have felt worse. We sat across from each other. He had a toothpick in his mouth, and he'd chew on it a little, then take it out, and then chew on it some more. Finally, he flicked it onto the beach. That article you read? Everything in it was true. I was a screw-off, and it didn't start with the Chargers. All through high school and college, I dogged practices, was late for meetings, had no work ethic at all. None but I was the best running back around by far. So when game time came around, the coaches found a way to get me on the field. Then I got to the pros where there were guys as good as me. I pulled the same crap and the Chargers got rid of me just like that. He snapped his fingers. I couldn't believe it. Sometimes I still can't believe it. So I came back to Seattle, my tail between my legs. I managed to land a job on sports radio and a few years later, you were born. That was quite a moment seeing you. I looked in your crib and I thought, He's not going to end up like me, wasting his talent. I know I've worked you hard all these years. Your mom says I put too much pressure on you, and I guess I do. But you're good at football, Mick. Really, really good. I don't want you to get so mad at me over this that you quit. I shook my head. I'm not going to quit. I love football. It's just... Just what? He said. It's just I don't get why you didn't tell me earlier. He laughed grimly. That's easy, Mick. Everybody I see at the radio station, friends of your mom's, friends of mine, they look at me and they think, there's Mike Johnson. He could have been great. You look at me and your eyes say, that's my dad. He is great. He paused. I couldn't give it up. We sat for a little longer, neither of us saying anything. Finally, he stood. So we're okay? Yeah, I said, we're okay. We'll still throw the ball around now and again. Yeah, we'll still throw the ball around. On the drive home, neither of us spoke. I don't know what I thought. I didn't hate him. I wasn't really even angry. But things would never be the same. He'd never be as big in my eyes as he had been, never take up so much of my world. After that, he still gave me advice on technique and strategy, and we still tossed the ball around the park. 
though we didn't do it that as much. The change wasn't in what we did, but in what we didn't say. He never again described the big plays he'd made on the football field, and I never again asked him about them. They were all in the past, buried. It was unspoken, but we both understood that the games that mattered were the games yet to be played. My games. So the end of part one, um, Mick is still in middle school. He's found out the truth about his dad's past when it comes to football. Um, and he's worked through his emotions of being angry with his dad, realizing that his dad isn't the football hero that he always thought he was. But by the end of part one, they have reconciled in that they are getting along again. They just don't talk about football as much as they used to. And they never really talk about his dad's past when it comes to football.